Hello everybody. This video then is designed as an introduction to Owen Shear's 2005 poetry collection, Skirid Hill. Um, so I'll go through some various aspects of that. I'll talk a little bit about the exam, about Shears as a man and as a poet, about the significance of location and where he sits in the literary context, and then I'll end this presentation by taking you through one poem that I think sums up his bond to the area that gives this collection its title. So, to begin then, a note on the exam. Well, first of all, this forms part of your paper two, the module called The Modern Age, Literature Since 1945. And it will form section A of that, which will take around 45 minutes. The paper as a whole is about two and a half hours long. The other two sections are respectively section B, uh, the unseen prose, where you'll get an extract from a novel and have one question on that, and then also the final question, which is where you'll be asked to compare uh, the novel, the modern novel, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, alongside uh, the modern drama, A Streetcar Named Desire. Um, so that's where it sits within that. Um, the question then for Skirid Hill will always be on a theme. It will never give a specific poem. So you always have a free choice of which poems you would like to write about. It's not like GCSE where it will state one. You always have free choice. Now, um, you always need to cover three to four poems in your answer, but they do not, apologies there for my terrible um, typo, they do not need to be equal. So you can talk about two mainly and then mention one or two others more briefly. That's absolutely fine. And to be honest, I think that's broadly the structure I would suggest if you focus on perhaps two and then just bring the other ones in more in passing. Um, Sometimes it might be the case that if there's a statement, you might suggest two poems that agree with a statement, and then you might want to bring in one that actually is slightly different in some way. Um, but I'll look at a specific sort of structure of the question on the next slide. Now, the collection contains about 45 poems, I think, speaking from memory, most of which are quite short. But for the reason I mentioned earlier, we do not need to cover them all. It's not like you would ever get caught out because it would name one you hadn't done. So what we will aim to do is we will aim to cover um, a very good representative selection of the poems so that you've got um, an ample battery to cover all the different necessary themes that you might need to answer on. The exam is open book. Um, like everything apart from the Othello question, you get the text in with you and actually what we have in school is we have a special set of these books that are kept in the exams office so that year on year we know that they are clean and have no notes in them. Um, so they're provided for you in the exam itself. Um, and this exam is marked using the normal mark scheme out of 25 that's been used for all your essays since the start of year 12. Um, so far nothing particularly complicated but there is one thing that I will add which is unusual about this question and which I'm pretty sure you will never have come across before and it's a new definition if you like for the idea of structure. Now when you have studied poetry in the past either with your GCSE anthology or the A-level year 12 anthology on Love Through the Ages because it's been an anthology, that is to say a collection of random poems that have been brought together, we only think about those as isolated poems. But because this is a collection put together by a single writer, and as it were curated by him, he has chosen the order and sequence of these poems rather than just throwing them together. That means, therefore, that we can talk about the structure of this as a collection as a whole. So suddenly things like the poem that comes first, the poems that come last, the poem that is in the centre of this collection, the way that they're grouped, um, that becomes important. Now, 
obviously that's something that we'll talk about in more detail as we start to look at the collection but it's just something to bear in mind it's something that is completely new to you let's now move on and let's start to have a look at the format of the questions so uh, the first thing to say about this is that you have a choice of two questions uh, and there will uh, obviously always be that to to give you that variety uh, now the way that they're structured there will always be a statement and a question so it's a bit similar to the in structure to things like the fellow questions that you've already been looking at um, and you should respond to both in your answers so if you look at number three which is the first question on um, Skirid Hill here in Skirid Hill men are shown to be either failures or bullies Examine this view of Shear's presentation of men in the collection. Now, when it says examine, really it's a, you know, it's a how far do you agree type question. That's what we're looking at here. So the presentation of men, how they're presented and to what extent are they failures or bullies on that sort of line or that continuum. Um, so you obviously, to answer it, the first thing you need to do in your introduction will be to decide whereabouts on that line you stand um, or are you going to uh, argue that yes that's the case and then don't have some poems demonstrating failures and some poems demonstrating that they're bullies how you approach it obviously will be up to you now question four then another one Owen Shears notes that the word skirid is derived from a Welsh word meaning divorce or separation Examine the view that the collection is dominated by this theme of separation. So again, you might want to choose some poems that would agree with that, and perhaps one or two that would disagree, uh, depending on how you choose to um, to answer it. But remember, essentially, you're looking at the statement and the keywords, sorry, the keywords from the statement, um, and the question um, its task as well. It says, as we, you'll notice here, it says at least two poems, but all the exam, uh, examiner meetings that myself and Mr. Taylor have been to have all agreed that three to four seems to be a better approach. But as we said, two in detail. Let's start off then by looking now at this image, which of course forms the cover illustration for Skirid Hill, and which will be familiar to you all um, having bought it. Um, it might be useful at this point to pause the video and just have a think about what uh, this appears like. What predictions can we make about the poetry and the, sh the preoccupations of Owen Shears, the things that he's interested in? I'm assuming now that you have paused that and had a think. So I'll draw your attention to a few things then here. For first of all, this image, I think, has been chosen because it is deliberately ambiguous. It looks partly like a landscape, a landscape under a sky, perhaps. You have then a sense, you know, of hills and veils and things like that. But it also, in a strange kind of way, looks almost human. There's something here that is almost body-like, and indeed, um, relationships are, are a key element that are explored in some of the poems in Shears collection um, but I think that deliberate ambiguity is something that is key and also if we look at the colouring here the way that the, this is representing this kind of silvery way and this block sky it's a very contemporary image and I think it's a way of reminding us that Owen Shears for all that he is not without historical influences is very much a modern poet and it's very much modern issues that he is exploring On the right, then, a quick reminder, because the first note that you get after the title page in this collection is a definition of the word skirid, divorce or separation. And the image you see here on the right, this is Skirid Hill itself. Um, you'll notice particularly how it has these sort of twin peaks, as it were. Um, more on that later but this is the uh, place that the whole collection is named for a little more detail on that in a moment so as a whole 
The ideas of divorce and separation preoccupy Shears, especially in the more metaphorical sense. Um, so some examples of the kind of issues that he explores on this idea of divisions or separations, things like the divide between the urban and the rural, between child and adult, or child and parent, past and present, relationships and splits, Welsh versus the kind of more global perspective. Um, and these are just some of the themes that he uh, explores, not always at the same time, sometimes in combination, sometimes in isolation, but these are the things that you can expect to um, see in some of his poetry, and there'll be others as well. In fact, it's worth noting, actually, that the last few slides of this presentation, which I won't talk, talk over, um, but which I've included for your reference, contain one of those uh, tables that you can find in revision guides that purport to demonstrate which themes are explored in which poems, uh, and that might be something that you want to have a look at, although I am aware that they can be a little confusing because they do seem to provide so much information in one place. Now, a little more detail then. Now, the Welsh novelist and critic in the post-war period, Raymond Williams, called this area of Wales border country. In fact, he wrote a novel of that name. And in actual fact, one of the collection, one of the poems in this collection is actually named border country, um, as if to emphasize this. Well, Skirid Hill sits on the Welsh border with England. In fact, part, I believe, on one side, part on the other. And it is in a land, this area, that is divided between England and Wales, an area that was much fought over um, through the medieval period until the Welsh princes were finally suppressed by the English kings. And in actual fact, that is why the oldest son of the King of England, uh, or Queen of England, is always known as the Prince of, Prince of Wales. When the Welsh were conquered, the English kings decided that they would appropriate that title, and that's why it has now become um, become that. And the fact that it's the son who gets that title, it sort of symbolises, I suppose, in a sense, yes, the bond with Wales, but also the fact that Wales will always be a junior partner. The son and heir will always be uh, subordinate to the reigning monarch. Now, the area is dominated by great castles built to subdue the local population. Um, they were known as marcher castles. In fact, the area was known as the Welsh marches. Um, and the, similarly, the, the, the men appointed to rule it and to defend it were known as the marcher lords. Um, but evidence of human activity and settlement goes back millennia. You know, it's relatively mysterious, relatively little known, but you will find all sorts. And just this one specific hill features ruins of an Iron Age hill fort, a medieval chapel, a flat stone known as the Devil's Table that predates potentially all of these things. Um, there's a local legend that says that the split on its top that generated the Twin Peaks I mentioned earlier occurred at the moment of Christ's crucifixion. <coughs> like most of these uh, local legends, one assumes there's not very much truth in it, but nonetheless that is the case. There's another interesting one, and that says that because of this uh, legend about the crucifixion, its soil was seen as holy, and indeed apparently um, it was customary that people would come and carry away a certain amount of the soil in order to uh, sort of bless, for example, things like the foundations of a new building or a field or something like that, in the same way that you might sprinkle something with holy water, they would sprinkle it with a little of this holy soil. So it's a, a, a very much a, a landscape with a rich and a dense um, history sitting behind it. Now, in terms of Shears himself, biographically there's not too much that's worth mentioning. Other than this, it's very common when we talk about him to think about him as a purely Welsh poet. But, as you'll see on here, quite an unusual life in the sense that he was born in 1974 in Fiji, of all unusual places, but brought up in Wales from the age of nine. 
Now, this is important then, because yes, we have somebody who is steeped in Wales, but not in the way of someone born to it. He is somebody whose perspective on Wales is simultaneously both that of an outsider and an insider. He has a deep um, understanding of it, a deep communion with it, but it's tempered with the, some of the objectivity of an outsider. Um, he had a range of jobs in his early years, including, uh, for example, being a uh, tiler. Um, it was a sort of summer job in Wales when he was a younger man. He worked as a television researcher, but for most of uh, his adult life, he's made his living partly from writing, but also from lecturing um, in universities. Um, he is a prize-winning poet, novelist, dramatist as well, and also, interestingly, a librettist, which is to say somebody who writes the words for uh, operas or oratorios. Um, so I suppose perhaps thinking about whether there are any kind of lyrical or perhaps song-like elements might be something we can bear in mind in his poetry. Now, the reason why I want to just briefly recap over a few ideas about landscape is because it's in this last couple of weeks of the term, it's his landscape poetry that I would like to particularly focus on. Now, for that reason then, a very brief history of uh, landscape in uh, literature. First of all then, what we call the um, pastoral. Um, now, as we've talked about many times before, this is something that is quite ancient. It goes back to certainly the uh, Romans and uh, to a lesser extent the Greeks as well. The very word pasta is the Latin meaning a shepherd. And that is a very significant key to this because it's this idea of a landscape that is, dis that is tamed, is cultivated, safe, natural, orderly, represented by that relationship between the shepherd and the flock, controlled. But of course, to some extent, it is a little bit divorced from reality. This is something that has always been idealised. You'll see the um, uh, image on the right here is from the uh, French uh, watercolourist of the 18th century, Claude Lorraine. It's a Roman landscape. He actually, oddly enough, becomes famous for painting Roman landscapes. Um, but these are something that were hugely popular with, for example, visiting Englishmen on the Grand Tour. And for that reason, you see huge numbers of his paintings now decorating the walls of English country houses and, to a lesser extent, English galleries. But you have everything here. You have the flock, in this case, of, of I think, uh, possibly cattle or goats. Um, you have the herdsmen. Um, you have his dogs. Um, that is demonstrated. But if we look at this landscape, we're looking at an almost cloudless sky. sky. It's dreamy. It's still. There's little wind. Um, and we have this really rather beautiful uh, sort of uh, castle on the left-hand side that again symbolises the sort of safe nature of this landscape. And this is an image that recurs and recurs and recurs. Anyone who has ever watched an episode of Escape to the Country, for example, will know that these kind of pastoral dreams are something that still preoccupy people, especially urban dwellers to this day. The number of people that you will see on there who will tell you that they're aged 65, they want to retire and move to the country and farm sheep or perhaps chickens or something like that, is really quite extraordinary. Not because they've ever looked after an animal in their life, apart from, from perhaps a dog, but because they have this idealised vision of what the countryside is like. And that's actually also something that's probably worth bearing in mind. The pastoral is a fundamentally urban vision because to idealise the, wor the world of dirt and smells and dung, you have to be a little bit divorced from it. If you live in a country among animal dung, for example, you probably have a much less romantic view of it. So, this is something that is very predominant. Um, you'll recall uh, a little while ago we looked at that poem by Marlowe, The Passionate Shepherd to His Love, which is a very good example of the uh, a poem that is in this genre, but it's something that crops up in many different situations. Now, 
in the 18th century, particularly the second half of the 18th century, there is a new artistic comment, uh, concept which comes into being, something that we call the sublime, always capitalised, the sublime, it's capitalised as like a proper noun. Um, and of course it refers to these conflictingly dramatic emotions of awe, of terror and admiration. Terrible beauty is an oxymoron that quite nicely encapsulates this. And it's a changing manner of appreciating the country. It's a moving on from seeing it as something that is pleasantly um, tame and attractive to appreciating its wilder senses. And this really wasn't always the case. It's been said that um, up until the 18th century, that when travellers were crossing the Alps in their carriages, crossing a place that we would all, I think, now see as being a truly beautiful and awe-inspiring landscape, it is said that they used to draw down the blinds because they did not want to look upon it. They did not want to see this symbol of disorder, chaos, danger. They simply wanted to blot it out. But the Romantics, um, the people of that period, turn this on its head and actually start to embrace this wildness and it becomes a symbol of further escape from um, the um, changes that were taking place in society of which more on the next slide um, so I've just got a couple of images here that briefly sort of sum this up the one on the top right there you'll see demonstrating a storm in a valley and again see the emphasis on the epic size and drama of this weather the bottom right image is by an, a much underrated painter called Joseph Wright of Derby um, it's actually Mount Vesuvius in eruption um, in the Bay of Naples um, but again, you, you see the emphasis on this enormous drama, the apocalyptic, hell-like um, colourings of this eruption, the sky, size again of the clouds that dwarf everything. Um, there's a thrill that to be had here. Perhaps the best modern um, representation of the sublime would be something like the experience of going on a roller coaster. It's that simultaneous experience of fear but of also but also of excitement. In the absence of roller coasters, they had it by venturing out into the wild, and it's for this reason that suddenly places like the Alps and Switzerland, um, but also in England, places like uh, the Lake District in Scotland, places like the Highlands that previously had been seen as these barbarous backwaters, suddenly start to become attractive. Um, the final image, the one on the left, is called um, something along the lines of a philosopher contemplating a wild landscape by a German painter called Caspar David Friedrich. Um, but again, it just demonstrates the way in which you take man out of the comfort of civilization into this uh, sort of communion with nature in its rawest and wildest form. Why then was this suddenly a thing? Well, one key answer is the Industrial Revolution. Broadly speaking, from the 1760s onwards, tremendous effect on cities and the rural landscape. First of all, then, you have the significant growth of cities as uh, factories are built uh, and the demand for jobs there brings in great uh, numbers of people from the rural poor for the prospect of more regular jobs in the city. Um, cities therefore expand in terribly insanitary conditions, they crawl out over the countryside, but there is an increasing number then, for example, of things like mines to supply coal and iron ore um, in order to fuel this industrial revolution. And so the countryside begins to be affected also. Gone are the days where it was possible perhaps to walk out from a city in or a town into unspoilt or seemingly unspoilt countryside. Um, we get a sense then for how things were uh, being changed. 
Now, the image on the bottom left here uh, is actually from uh, the uh, 19th century. Uh, it's called Manchester from Curzel Moor. And it's quite interesting because, in a way, as our, our eye almost follows this image from the past into the present, or perhaps even from his point of view, the future. In the foreground, you have this rather nice landscape. You have these trees, this little rocky outcrop. You have meadows behind, and these two picturesque-looking peasants sitting by the left-hand side. All of that is not so dissimilar to what you saw on the Claude Lorraine image a couple of slides ago. But then in the background, sweeping across, you have the silhouette of Manchester itself. Factory after factory, chimney after chimney, all belching out smoke and pollution into this haze of cloud. Gone is that wonderful cloudless um, sky of Lorraine. What we're looking at here is, I think, personally, one of the most graphic uh, representations of the impact of the Industrial Revolution on this country. Um, one further image, which I, I particularly like as well, um, this is also by our old friend Joseph Wright of Derby, he of the Vesuvius image on the previous page. Uh, this is of, I think, Cole Brookdale in the West Midlands, seen as being one of the first places where modern industry began to take form. And the image is of uh, an industrial area by night. The first thing to note is how um, he has used a very similar colour palette to the way that he depicted that eruption on Vesuvius. Um, and we see in here now the light of these forges and boilers and things like that. But the way that it glows up through the smoke through this night air, in fact it barely looks like night at all, such as the light that's being given out. Um, but he's depicting it in a similarly uh, apocalyptic way to that volcano eruption. Um, it demonstrates, I suppose, on a sort of more close-up scale, some of the impact of the modern industrial revolution. For this reason, you can then see why there is a sudden urge to go out and to explore those parts of nature that do not seem to have been damaged by the hand of man. And that's, I think, where the romantic aspect comes into being. Finally, then, the, the key... Um, the key sort of movements uh, in literature that responds to this is what we call the Romantic poets, and it does tend to be mainly poets. Notice once again that in this context the word Romantic is a proper noun, the name of the movement, so it's always capitalised. includes poets that you will know, like Shelley of Ozymandias fame, Blake as of London, Wordsworth of the Prelude, people like that, alongside figures like Lord Byron, John Keats, uh, other people that you will have heard of. Uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, who you know as a critic from his views on Othello, was also himself a poet of the Romantic period. Um, and as it says here, interested in these ideas of the sublime and about redefining our nature, relationship with nature in the wild. And particularly you have this idea about the relationship between geographical and personal exploration and self-discovery. Now, in a way, the most typical Romantic poem that you have seen is the extract from the prelude and the way in which that journey of the man in the boat across the lake until he got frightened of the big hill um, was seen to be representative of his wider coming of age and his wider awakening. That, in a sense, is a kind of archetypal romantic poem. That's the sort of thing that they were ex interested in. Um, and it's making these almost philosophical links between the world and themselves. Um, Owen Shears, though, has a very different view of this, and I think what we can think of is him as a fundamentally post-industrial landscape poet. He is a poet who explores the impact that mankind has had on the world, not in the way of the Romantics, simply by avoiding it, not in the way of the pastoral, by idealising it, but by exploring it rather as it is. A few ideas here then, talking about the extent to which landscape is both scarred by, but also recovering from the legacy of industrial activity. Um, Wales 
was heavily involved in mining, especially for coal and slate, but with many rivers, meant that in the early days when mills were powered by water before steam, many were sited along rivers. Um, so in a sense, Wales was very much a cradle of the Industrial Revolution in a very similar way to places like South Yorkshire for mining, um, or like Leeds and Manchester for cloth weaving, for example. Um, now, a couple of images on the right here. The bottom one shows an old scrapyard. Um, just again, I've used this simply to illustrate this idea of the kind of juxtaposition between nature and man's scarring upon it. Um, the top image um, shows three uh, different phases, if you like, of rewilding and dewilding. The middle image shows a landscape that, as you'll see, has been farmed and tamed. You can see mo a mown meadow there in the background, but largely, for example, deforested. For that to be rewilded, you see on the right there, for example, you're looking at a landscape um, back to na natural watercourses, back to being forested, um, or of course, if it were to be dewilded, something that might be built on and further, um, further destroyed. But again, it's these kind of tensions um, that also interest Shears in his landscape poetry. So, in the next video, what I will do is we'll talk through this poem specifically. For now, though. Um, we'll pause it there.